Thomas Thornycroft was an English artist who lived between May 1815 and August 1885. Thornycroft established his fame and his wealth for being the preferred sculpturist of Queen Victoria. But in 1856, Thornycroft started a sculpture that he would continue to work on until his death in 1885. This sculpture showed a woman with her two daughters in a chariot charging into battle. In 1902, this sculpture was coated in bronze and placed on a Victoria embankment, facing off with the House of Parliament. But who was this mysterious woman, and have we had her wrong all these years? But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very special thank you to all of our producers and our patrons on this channel. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to join our patron and our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. And of course, also a very, very special thank you to our sponsor, ASEA. If you would like information about ASEA or information on how to buy ASEA wholesale, please text Bryce Info to the number down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about Queen Boudicca. Was she truly just an historic figure, or is she a forgotten ascended master? Now I'm going to be very honest with you guys. I never thought that I would be doing a deep dive into Queen Boudicca. Queen Boudicca is actually one of my favorite historical figures. She's quite a badass as, as we'll see in this story. But there's not really much to what we know about her specifically. Hence why I never thought I would be doing a deep dive. However, over this last week when I was traveling, I heard Magdalene whisper Boudicca in my ear. It was right as I was crossing the state line into Florida, and, and I was very confused. Boudicca? Why was Magdalene telling me the name Boudicca? And then it hit me. Is Boudicca a forgotten, ascended master? After all, we know, we know that Queen Boudicca was Celtic. We know that she was very tall with very long, thick red hair, fierce eyes. We know that the Roman Empire did not like her. We know that the Emperor Nero, whose numbers were 666, did everything he could to torture and torment her after the passing of her husband. But is there more to this story? Is there something more that we are not seeing? Now, I'm going to go through what we know. And then I'm going to tell you my speculation. And at this point, all it is is pure speculation. So let's start at the beginning. Again, Boudicca was a queen in the United Kingdom, Britannia. And she and her husband reigned in the first century AD, or at least that's what they tell us. There isn't much we know about Boudicca's early life. Really, all we know from her starts at her marriage to her husband, King Prasuticus. We do know that most likely Boudicca was of a royal bloodline. We also know that Boudicca herself was considered to be a high priestess. 
We also know that even though Boudicca was the queen of the Iceni people, she herself was a very humble queen and would often be seen working in the fields with the common folk. We know that Boudicca was considered to be very intelligent and also practiced medicine. And by practicing medicine, I mean she practiced real medicine. She worked with herbs. She helped her community heal themselves with plant medicine, the type of medicine that many women in centuries to come would be accused of witchcraft for practicing. Boudicca and her husband, King Prasudicus, had two daughters. Now, we don't know the names of these daughters, and it's very um, foggy and murky as to what actually happened, what became of these two daughters, which, which we'll get to at the end of this story. Now, again, as I said, this couple ruled the Iceni people during the first century AD. The area where the Iceni tribe lived is close to Norfolk, England today. It's in the eastern border of the island of Britannia, north of London. They tell us that Boudicca lived during what historians and archaeologists call the Iron Age. At this point, the island of Britannia was pretty much considered the end of the world. As most people probably are aware, at that point, Britannia was a very, very harsh place to live. Very cold, very rainy. The beaches of the UK are not like the beaches here in the United States or in the islands. It's rough water, it's rough winds. I lived in England in the early part of the 2000s and even in modern times as a girl from Georgia, it was really rough for me because the weather was so different and the elements were so much harsher than they are down here in the Sun Belt of the United States. Well, because of this, the people of Britannia, all these different tribes, really didn't encounter a lot of outside influence. Now, they were Celtic people, and they practiced Druid faiths. And if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that Magdalene herself, even though she was Egyptian, was considered to be of Celtic origins. And if you've been on this channel again for a while, you know we talk a lot about the Cassiopeians. And the Cassiopeians have said many times that they're there is a portal in Kiev in the Ukraine, and many, many years ago, a planet called Kenteka, not Kentucky, not saying Kentucky, I'm saying Kenteka, which was a planet system, was overtaken by the service to self, the negative beings, just kind of like what we're going through here on planet Earth. Well, the planet Kenteka was mostly made of polarized positive humanoid beings. And once that planet was destroyed, these negative fourth density negative beings took all the inhabitants of Kinteka and brought them to planet Earth through the portal of Kiev. And as the Cassiopeians have said, these would be our Celtic people, our Druids, the Kentuckians. The Kentuckians also resembled Palladians and Lyrans. They had the reddish blonde hair, blue or green eyes. Now, granite, blonde hair, and red hair pretty much run in the same family as do blue and green eyes. I know that two blue-eyed parents cannot have a brown-eyed child, but two blue-eyed parents absolutely can have a green-eyed child because it's in the same family. These are cultures that we see like river dance. And this Celtic culture spread from Kiev, where they were dropped off, all throughout the continental European continent up into the United Kingdom. Now, whether this is actually the right location is still up for debate, but for what we know now, that's what we're going to go with. And so in saying that, even though the people of Britannia were Celtic in heritage or Kentuckian in heritage, they would still communicate a lot with their Celtic and Druid brothers and sisters down in Gaul or France, which I find super, super fascinating because if you're a history buff like me, you know that the English people and the French people have never gotten along. They've always fought. And, and, and this really, we really see this in 1066, or so they say, 1066, when William of Orange conquers the United Kingdom, creating the royal family that we see today that's not actually British. In fact, from what I understand, understand people who are genetically British have more um, brown eyes, brown hair. The blue-eyed, blonde-haired British people 
our caring Celtic culture that again is coming from the lineage of the Kentuckian star constellation. In fact, I'll tell you guys a little funny story about the harshness of this area. As you know, I'm a huge reality TV fan. That's how I relax as I watch. That's my junk food is watching reality TV. And the Real Housewives of New Jersey were heading to Ireland for a cast trip. And one of the characters was packing a bunch of bathing suits and her husband walks in. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you packing these bathing suits? And she was like, well, Ireland's an island. And he was like, oh, honey, it's not that kind of island. It's not tropical, right? It's not tropical. So I, I thought that was kind of funny. So that just kind of shows you again, this area of the world is, is not very friendly when it comes to, to humans and, and our survival in these very cold, hard places. Now, besides just the interactions they would have with their Celtic brothers and sisters in what we call France or continental Europe, they didn't really see much of any of the outside world. Again, the Britannia Island was can, kind of considered like the, the no man's land, the end of, of the world as people knew it. And it, it was very difficult to, to farm there, even though most of the tribes were farming farming communities. I mean, think about it. If you're living in somewhere like Italy or Greece, where the weather is really good conditions why are you going to go move up to the uk especially if you don't have modern technology and try to start all over again the people living in britannia knew how to work with the elements the people outside of britannia it was quite a shock to the system and so they were relatively kind of left alone you know sometimes these tribes would war within themselves we, we see with the tribes of britannia there's a, there's a lot of similarities from what we see with the tribes of america where britannia itself the island was not one nation and in fact all the tribes themselves were considered to be different nations and sometimes they got along and they traded with each other's and sometimes they had little scuffles same thing over here in the United States so at the time of the Roman invasion Britannia was not one joined force nation again multiple nations multiple tribes living scattered all over this island in 55 BC Julius Caesar decided that that he was going to start to expand the Roman Empire into this area that was kind of considered a no man's land. From the get-go, there was resistance to the Roman Empire. And once more, we saw a huge influx of Celtic people from continental Europe coming into Britannia to help them fight off the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans created the word called barbarians. Anybody that lived outside of the boundaries of the Roman Empire was considered to be a barbarian. This, we see, is the start of propaganda. Propaganda from the Roman Empire to try to garner support from the Roman people as they basically came in and demolished the tribes living in Britannia. We see this propaganda still being used today with the controllers, I believe the Roman Empire were, or the controllers that we still have today, with things like Hillary Clinton using the word deplorable to define the people that opposed her. So I thought that was interesting to observe that Julius Caesar and Hillary Clinton both have used the same tactics to try to make their opposition look wild and crazy. I mean, once you start to see the workings of the controllers, you really can't unsee it. And for as smart as they are, they do tend to play the same playbook over and over and over it again. At this point, it's getting a little predictable what they're going to do. Now, the Roman Empire by this time was definitely a military machine. I mean, there's no other way they would have conquered all these lands if it weren't for being a military machine. These men were trained heavily and knew how to work together in big groups in order to conquer the people and the lands that they were trying to conquer. And th this wasn't true for, again, Br the people of Britannia. The, the tribes here, again, only really worked within themselves and they practice more from no I'm, I'm not a war expert I'm not somebody that's really studies military combat in history but it just seems to me that the um, Iceni people and their neighboring tribes practice more of what we kind of call guerrilla warfare now they tell us with the American Revolution that guerrilla warfare is really what helped the Patriots win the American Revolution I have my doubts about that story now you guys know that 
but this is kind of what these tribes were doing. But at first, these tribes were no match to the makings of this matrix of the Roman Empire. Now, something else that I found very, very fascinating about the tribal people of Britannia, especially the Iceni people, when they would go into battle, they would go into battle pretty much naked, which does show you that these people were very used to the climate of Britannia to be able to do that pretty much naked um, and they would do this so that they would or at least historians tell us and archaeologists tell us that, that they believe that they would do this because it allowed them easier access to their weapons they have found some remains where some of the warriors of Britannia would wear some sort of a vest to try to protect them from spears and swords and stuff but most of the people that fought would go in with very little clothing on and on top of that, y'all, this like really blew my mind. And 10 years ago, I don't know if I would have noticed this like I noticed this now. The people of Britannia, especially, especially the Iceni people, would paint their body in a blue color that came from blue woad. Now, blue woad is a, a plant. It comes from a plant that's indigenous to Europe. It's it's indigo and blue woad are like the two plants from what I understand when textiles that actually already have a produced color versus the other colors that have to kind of be produced through the mixing of other colors if that makes sense but they would they would paint themselves in this blue woad to go into battle A bit like my Siddhartha Buddha head is blue, we know that blue is a very important color. After all, most of the Hindu deities are blue, and they have their reasons for being blue. We know that in Egyptian hieroglyphics, there were blue people. And that is so fucking fascinating, because if we think about warfare today and we think, oh, we try to camouflage, or if you're going hunting, which I, I don't really support hunting, but you're going to camouflage yourself so that the enemy or your prey can't see you. Well, blue's going to stand out. It's kind of like the redcoats, the British redcoats in the American Revolution. They could see them coming a mile away because they had freaking redcoats on, right? But this blue, they believed that this blue woad, this color, would give them magical powers. Again, the Hindu deities are blue. Now, they'll tell you today, historians will tell you today, that they kind of ran around like wild banshees in battle and they were drinking a lot before they went into battle in order to give them some sort of like liquid courage. And no, they didn't, I don't think they called it liquid courage back then, that's a modern word. But they would they would kind of get, get grow some balls, right, from, from the alcohol to be able to go into these battles. Now, this is interesting to me because we know that especially with like the Russian culture, that there's a lot of vodka drinking because alcohol does warm up the body. So there could have been an element of that. There could have been an element where they were trying to warm themselves up to go out naked with blue paint on their bodies in order to battle. But I'm kind of suspicious that this wasn't actually alcohol because if we're talking about the blue woad having magical powers, and if we're talking about a lot of the priests, or a lot of, excuse me, a lot of the kings and queens being priests and priestesses, which we know Magdalene and Yashua were that as well, maybe this was some sort of a peyote or like an ayahuasca that they would also take in in order to activate some powers that they knew they had that we've forgotten we have i don't know i hope you guys are following along with what i'm kind of getting at here i just it's just interesting and again this is all just speculation and we won't know until we fully know but i thought i would bring it up we also see the iceni people with these crazy designs all over their bodies and i don't mean crazy in a bad way they're actually quite beautiful and we know that people who are at least we've been told through divination, that people who have 
like crazy like like my boyfriend for example is covered in tattoos he has a full sleeve on one arm he's got a half sleeve on the other arm one of his legs is fully tattooed he's had them for years he's just like addicted to getting tattoos and the people like that they say that in other galactic constellations that many humanoid beings have their light language encoded on their body and so people who crave tattoos possibly it could be that they're missing having that light language and so that's what they're trying to put on their body i think that's what my boyfriend that i really do believe that about him because he's very very galactic in his mind he's very much about extraterrestrial life and fascinated by it so i do think that's why he that made sense that resonated when I learned that because like, Oh, that, that makes sense. They're looking for their old light language. And so when we look at the battles of these Britannia tribes with their, their blue paint and their intricate designs, even for women too, all over their bodies, I want to speculate that there's something more here. And this propaganda of calling them barbarians and like, outcast of society who needed to be civilized by the roman empire i think this was a, a big smear campaign so that people of the roman empire would stop remembering the fact that we are galactic beings does that make sense am i making it makes sense in my head does that make sense in your head you know because it's just interesting it's super interesting and i want to point out that the designs that they wore on their body also resembled in some ways the nazca lines of peru another topic we'll be getting into soon so how is it that they were able to put these intricate designs on their bodies that match from other cultures across the world y'all this is galactic and that's what they don't want us to know just like Hillary Clinton didn't want people to know that the people opposing her knew a little something that they didn't know, hence why she called us deplorables. See how this works? So from 55 BC all the way to 49 AD, the Roman Empire was coming in, pounding, 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 taking Britannia from the tribal people. It took 104 years, so even though these were barbarians who weren't trained in proper military technique according to the Roman Empire, they obviously put up a huge fight for many generations since it took 104 years to finally gain control of a large part of the island of Great Britain. And this was under the Roman Emperor Claudius. Now I want to take a moment to step back a little bit. We have, as I've talked about, the Britannia tribal people, and then over here we have the Roman Empire that's coming in and invading Britannia. We know what the history books tell us. This is what I've been kind of quoting from is the history books, what we've learned. They're Roman Empire, blah, blah, blah. But you guys know that I don't actually believe the Roman Empire existed. I know that might sound crazy if you're new to this channel and you're welcome to think that sounds crazy. But let me tell you guys, I'm a huge history lover, history all throughout school. I never had to study for a history test because I always just remembered it because I found it so fucking fascinating. This is why I love reality TV today. History is juicy. It's juicy and it's gossipy and it's really fascinating. And so I would always remember history. And so I always aced my test and I never studied and I still retain that information because I find it so freaking fascinating. So for me to sit here right now and tell you guys that I don't think the Roman Empire actually exists is really big because for most of my life i was fascinated by the roman empire i think the roman empire is code code for the controllers all of the architect we see from the romans i personally believed is tartarian architecture but the tartarian stuff definitely a subject for another day but let's look at these roman emperors that are existing right now Again, I don't actually know. In my own mind, I don't actually know when Boudicca lived. Ten years ago, I would have told you, yeah, she lived in the first century AD as what we've been told by our matrix system in our education. So I don't know where to place this scuffle. I don't know if this scuffle actually happened during um, the fall of Atlantis or if this scuffle with Boudicca actually happened 
right before the mud floods, which makes it very close to where we're living today, which I'll tell you why I'm questioning that towards the end of this episode. Because many people will probably say, oh, well, she probably lived at the fall of Atlantis. Like, this is the tribulation. All we know, though, is that whether it was the fall of Atlantis or the fall of Tartaria, the bad guys took control, basically. They won. So it was either the fall of Atlantis or the fall of Tartaria, right? But let's look at who these bad guys were, who these Roman emperors were. And I have gone back and forth of whether I want to deep dive into these people more because holy shit, the scandal and the depravity of these people is just unbelievable. We also know starting with Julius Caesar in 55 BC, there's a lot of intermixing with Cleopatra. And in fact, I will put all of my Cleopatra and Egyptian videos about that down in the description box below. So you can kind of see how these Egyptian cultures intertwine with this these romans right well let's just go down the list for a minute so we can really see how fucking evil these people were so first we got julius caesar then after julius caesar we have caesar augustus now caesar augustus was the grand nephew and adopted son of julius caesar caesar augustus allegedly died of natural causes at the age of 75. From him, we have Tiberius. Tiberius was the stepson and former son-in-law of Augustus, and he died at the age of 77. Now, it is speculated that he was murdered by Caligula. Now, Caligula and Nero are the two, like, whoa, like, these guys are, like, I mean, there's not a whole lot I can say, but these guys make Hillary Clinton look like a fucking saint. So Caligula was the grand nephew and great grandson of Augustus. Now Caligula was known, again, to be a pure evil. He was extremely cruel. He was a sadism and had many sexual perversions. And he was, by the Roman Empire, considered to be a tyrant. In fact, he was so evil that he was assassinated by the senators of Rome at the age of 28. After Caligula was assassinated by the senators, Claudius became the emperor of Rome. And this is the emperor, Emperor Claudius, who sealed the deal on Britannia, who ended the 104-year conquer of this island. Now, Claudius was Caligula's uncle and the grand nephew of augustus so this is one big messed up family line now claudius after he had conquered great britain he too was murdered by his wife through poisoning his wife murdered him so her son nero could take control of the empire and this handoff between Claudius and Nero is the time period of Boudicca's rebellion against the Roman emperors. Now, again, Nero, he's the 666. Um, many, many people believe Nero was actually the Antichrist spoken about in the Bible that rose up during the apocalypse, which would have been the fall of Atlantis. So that is where I'm kind of hinging on this happening at the fall of Atlantis during the tribulation before the a thousand years of peace, which was Tartaria. There is one other possible evidence that makes me think we got to shift it a little bit closer to where we live now. But again, we'll get to that at the end of this, this deep dive. Um, but that's, that. I mean, Nero was 666. So this is all happening. This crazy Roman empire with their fucked up family, their cabal family who are doing all sorts of debauchery, they're coming in and taking over Britannia. Now, we know that the controllers like to work very methodically and very slowly. So as they started to take over Britannia, they started more smear campaigns. They started saying that the Druids were practicing things like human sacrifice and cannibalism, but that's not true, you guys. And I know a lot of people in our community are still pretty brainwashed by that. They still think the Druids were bad. Because the church told them so. The Roman Empire told them so. 
No, the Druids were herbalists. They were healers. They were not doing the human sacrificing or the cannibalism that was being performed by the Roman Empire. And I don't even need to speculate that. We have so much evidence of this. I mean, a few generations later, centuries later, we're going to see Constantine of the Roman Empire boil his life alive for shits and giggles in the town square after he supposedly became a Christian. I mean, we only know Christianity is Satanism anyway, but you guys see what I'm saying? Like, that's just a smear campaign. And that's what narcissists and psychopaths do. Whatever they are doing themselves, they will blame on you. So it takes it's it's projection and it takes the spotlight off them and puts it on you. So no, the Druids were not doing this. This is what the Roman Empire was doing. Now let's back up again and go back to Claudius before Nero's mama comes in. Like talk about a mama's boy. Like if you got to get your mama I and mean, that's what freaking Solomon's mom did. Bathsheba, wasn't that Solomon's mom? David and Bathsheba had Solomon and we know he was like a wicked wizard like man if you're still worshiping Solomon have fun in fourth density negative because he was a raging Satanist but his mom Bathsheba went and killed some of his brothers so that he would be put up as the king of, of Israel right so so these these people like to have their mamas do their dirty work right but before Nero's mama did her dirty work on her husband Claudius um Claudius had worked out kind of like a partnership with Britannia. And I know that, you know, evil is definitely on a scale. And I'm not saying that Claudius himself was a good person. I never knew the guy. But out of all of the, the emperor, emperors of Rome, or Rome, the controllers, coming in, he seems to be the one that was kind of the most fair. And so he decided that he was, if, if, if these kings and queens of these tribes were to basically just kind of surrender, he would work out a deal with them where they could kind of keep their tribes, keep their culture. They were still basically the manager in charge as long as they didn't really push back against the Roman Empire. And it seemed that when Claudius came in, Boudicca and her husband, Prasuticus, made a deal with Claudius. And Prasuticus himself became a citizen of the Roman Empire, but nothing really changed for the community because they had kind of taken the knee. They kind of left them to do their own thing, right? And they would send money to them and help them out financially, kind of like the way we do it now with our matrix system where you know we're born, we have these birth certificates and we kind of become property of the country. Then that kind of is what Prostuticus and Boudicca kind of got themselves into. It very much mimics what happens with our birth certificates today, in my opinion, from my research. So not only were they now citizens of Rome, they were considered a friend of Rome and they were considered a client kingdom. Once again, sounds very much like the franchises of our countries. And everything was going perfectly fine no one noticed anything until Prasuticus died and Claudius died once Prasuticus died and once Claudius died Nero was in charge now in the Druid culture as we see from Magdalene herself and Yeshua women were considered to be leaders they could very much rule a kingdom. And Boudicca was not just the queen by marriage. She was also royal blood too. And so the way it worked with his death in his will, Prasuticus left the Iceni tribe to, after Boudicca's passing, it would go to their two daughters who we don't have names for. We don't know their names and the Roman empire. So they would be joint kind of managers of this area. And so Prasuticus passes away and life kind of goes on as the Iceni people normally would have it go on when their ruler would die. Boudicca took over to help her daughters manage this transition where her daughters would now be, when they came of age, would be in control. Well, Nero was not going to have that because in the Roman Empire, women were not considered to be anything, right? Maybe that's why Claudius' wife killed him. I don't know. So we're seeing with the Roman Empire, the controllers, this destruction of the divine feminine, hence why the controllers made Magdalene a prostitute, right? When she was actually the Christ, right? So we're seeing this where Nero not only is a raging psychopath who is a lot like Caligula and his debauchery and Satanism, but he's like, oh, hell no, 
this woman is not going to be partnered with me. And so he sends his generals in to basically like rape and steal and take everything from all these tribes, not just the Iceni, but all these other tribes of Britannia. So basically the contract that Boudicca's husband had with the Roman, Roman Empire was basically ripped up by Nero was just null and voided. In fact, Nero's plan was basically to commit genocide against the Celtic tribes. He didn't want any more Celts left on this earth, any more Kentuckians left on this earth. Now, they didn't have a word for extermination or genocide back then, but that that's what he was doing. You know, we know that the word, we, we, or we, we assume the word, the bad word fuck comes from fornication under consent of the king, and that was allegedly done by the english monarch to the scottish women to breed out scottish blood well the same thing was kind of happening here with nero he was sending his tribes in or his men his military men into these tribes to rape the women impregnate the women with roman children so that that they would basically eventually wipe out the celtic heritage and they would murder the men or take the men especially the leaders of the tribes into slavery into the roman empire and what happened next to Boudicca is a trauma that I don't think any of us would survive. Boudicca was collected one day with her daughters and taken to the city center, the tribal town center. She was tied up to a pole and she was flogged. Now, they used instruments of torture like the cat of nine tails. As she was being flogged and tied up, her daughters were also brought out. And we don't have any record of how old her daughters were. From paintings and from the sculpture and on Victoria and embankment, they were probably, I would assume, in their teenage years. So they were still young. The girls were tied up on these planks of wood. And as Boudicca was being flogged by a cat of nine tails, her daughters were being raped publicly. So Boudicca had to watch her children be tortured while she herself was being tortured. And the Cat of Nine Tails, it, from my research, was one of the torture devices that brought you the closest to death because it would rip your flesh off of your back or wherever you were being whipped to the point where the victim, the person who has just been whipped, basically their back is just bone with flesh hanging off. Now, some of the historians that I studied preparing for this episode said that this type of flogging can in fact cause psychotic breaks. And I, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that being under that much trauma, especially as a, she just lost the love of her life. I, I'm very certain that that was her twin. Um, they had a very great marriage. So he's dead. She's got these two daughters. Her people who she feels responsible for are being completely abused by this Roman empire. Um, And from the records, we know Boudicca really cared about her people. She was a high priestess herself. And now she's being not only humiliated, but she's being tortured to death. And she's having to watch her children go through this too. So I don't doubt that there was not some sort of a psychotic break. But I don't, I, I think that's, I think by just saying that's what happened to her is, is, is again, propaganda. Because what happened to her was horrible. And she fought back. She was pushed to the edge where she said, you're not going to do this anymore. And so Boudicca in 60 AD, right after this happened, she got tribal people, not just from the Iceni people, not just her people, but neighboring tribal people. She got them to get together to get rid of the Roman Empire once and for all from their island. Now at this point, because so much time had passed, the whole landscape of Britannia had changed, according to the archaeologists and the historians. Before the Roman Empire came into Britannia, we were talking about a lot of agriculture, a lot of hut life where they build, built these specific huts. It was very private. It was very small. Once the Roman Empire came in, though, they had 
better roads. They had an actual sewage system. They had bath houses. There was more trading, more merchants everywhere, which we're going to get into when we get into the city of London or the, the city we call London today. So the, the, um, geography of this land had drastically changed. Now, again, that's what the history books tell us. I personally, once again, believe the Roman leftovers are Tartarian. So I don't really know how that fits into all this, but I'm just sharing with you guys what my research has shown. So the Roman governor at this time was a man named Paulinius. And Paulinius was really known to be very, very good at military. Um, they're just people, I mean, even in today's world, we have people who are just really good at strategizing in, in a military industrial complex. So that that he was good at this. And he had gotten, or at least he thought, that he had gotten the people of Britannia to really calm down you know, it's been, again, it's been 100 years, so they're kind of getting used to the Roman luxuries of sewage systems and bathhouses and merchants. Life is changing for them. A lot of children, young adults, even Boudicca, were born into a time where this change was happening. And so, and so he felt like he was good to kind of leave this area for a while. And he headed over to Western Britannia, to a place now we call Wales, right, the Welsh area, to again start to conquer more land for the Roman Empire. Now, this guy was also, from what I read, sacrificing people along the way to the gods of the Roman Empire, which we know what that is, it's Lucifer, doing the same thing that, that the, they're still doing today on those islands. And so he would impale them, he would do all these things. So he was brutal. And, you know, psychologically, I could see, like, you've got this system in Britannia that you're used to, you're like a 20, 30 year old person and you're used to the bathhouse now you're used to they had a heating system in their floors they were able to figure out how to heat the floors they've got a sewage system all that kind of stuff and and not only so so you've got these comforts of the roman empire but you've also got this leader who's batshit crazy right and so i i, I would i i can understand why this governor was like yeah they're not going to mess with me they're scared of me let's go conquer more lands well Boudicca at this point who really i mean what's what's the janice joplin song freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose bobby mcgee at this point Boudicca really had nothing left to lose the absolute worst thing that could have happened to her and her daughters did and so she was like balls to the wall hell hath no fury like a woman scorned and she rounded up about 230,000 Britannians to join her in her conquest of the Roman Empire. Now it is said that, and I believe this as integrity, as the leader of the, as, as the responsibility that she held for herself as the leader, as the queen of the Iceni people, as the high priestess, she rode in the front line with her daughters to charge the Roman Empire. We've got the governor Paulinus all the way over on the other side of the island, okay? And so she takes her 230 people and the first town that they come to and that they conquer is Camelodium. This is now Colchester in Essex. Now, Colodium was kind of a big deal city. It was kind of like the, the capital at this point before London eventually became the capital. I don't even know if they had those words for like capitals, but it was it was a big deal city. It There was a lot of military there. There were a lot of military forts there. And so the fact that she came in with 230,000 tribal people and destroyed it, is pretty amazing and pretty embarrassing for Nero and for the governor Paulinius. I mean, here all these years, they've started this smear campaign about these poor little heathens, these barbarians, these deplorables of Britannia. They need us to come in and civilize them, bless their hearts. And now these deplorables, these barbarians took their country back. At least for a little while. Now, when Polinius got word that Boudicca, a woman to boot, had led all these people and destroyed basically the capital of Britannia, he, again, not only was he probably super embarrassed, but he probably shit his pants a little bit and was like, what is happening? So he started to gather his troops. He, he realized that Boudicca and her people were headed to Londinium. 
which is now, yes, the city of London. At this point, Londinium was not the London we see today. It was a home to about 30,000 people. And because of its placement on the River Thames, it was definitely a merchant city. It was not a city that was prepared for invasion or for war. Now, the victors always write the history books. So it's interesting that after this was all said and done, the victors, the Roman Empire, was saying that Boudicca was going through and slaughtering her own people, and she was just, like, mass killing all these people in Londinium. But then if you look at other resources, that's not true. She actually would take people on. People would join her. When she would get to Londinium, these Br British people, these, these tribal people, would join her, join forces with her and their fellow countrymen to get rid of the Roman Empire. Now, as Paulinus was trying to come off and meet Boudicca, he realized there was no way he could cut her off in Londinium. Because again, Londinium was not set up for military. Let's back up to how we spoke about in the beginning about the guerrilla-style warfare. So these Roman soldiers were very matrixy trained in their combat abilities, but the tribal people had come from more guerrilla warfare. So Polinius knew that if he met Boudicca in Londinium, Boudicca would kick his ass because they knew how to really fight. They weren't trained on a matrix system of military like the Roman officers. It would have totally confused the Roman officers. They wouldn't have known what to do. So instead, Paulinius kind of allowed her to come through Londinium, picking up more and more and more people on her way and cut her off and met her in a place in kind of middle UK, a little north of Londinium near Manchester today. Now, at this point, Boudicca absolutely had the upper hand. Again, this was 230,000 people plus some going up against an army of about 10,000 people. They say, or the recorded history says, that standing along the hillsides were children cheering on Boudicca and her men. Boudicca charged forward with her daughters and everybody charged against the Roman Empire. And this is where the story takes a sad and drastic turn. And I think that it took the sad and drastic turn because astrologically that was what was supposed to happen. Whether this happened at the fall of Atlantis during the tribulation before the thousand years of peace or whether this happened at the fall of Tartaria before the mud floods before Gog and Magog, it was time for the bad guys to kind of show their stuff in this polarized planet. Because in that field, the Roman Empire, the Roman soldiers knew what to do. The tribal people of Britannia just charged. The Romans were methodical, though. They knew how to come around and how to take them out. In that battle alone, 80,000 Britannians were killed to only 400 Roman soldiers. The remaining Britannias that were fighting were sold into slavery. Some were later executed. Boudicca herself, so they say, committed suicide on the field by drinking some poison. And I actually don't blame her because her alternative of being captured by, by Polinius, she had already been almost flogged to death by these people for nothing, for seriously just being like the queen. She didn't do anything against them. It was just who she was. So the fact that she had done something against them meant that her life, she was going to be tortured to death anyway or sold into brutal slavery. And so she took her own life. I'm assuming her daughters took their lives as well. I don't know. There's not a lot of sources that say what happened to her daughters. Now, they say that Boudicca is buried underneath King's Cross, which I find very fascinating. We don't know for sure. This is just speculation. But there was an attack on King's Cross. I actually love King's Cross. It's one of my favorite areas of the UK. Last time I was in the UK, I was there um, a few years ago for a yoga thing, and it, I stayed there at the King's Cross. It's very magical. And just like I believe Magdalene is buried in Ottawa, I think that these bodies of these ascended masters get placed specifically in certain areas in order to harness their magic. That's just my opinion, my speculation. 
But I think she was, I, I think there's a reason why King's Cross was built on top of her burial, if that is true. Now, for many years, as they say, for many years, the story of Boudicca was forgotten about. Her story didn't apparently reemerge until some records were found during the Tudor dynasty. And then she kind of faded away again and came back with vengeance in the Victoria age. Now, you guys do know I am a, des a descendant of Queen Victoria. I want to really reiterate that being born of a bloodline doesn't make you bad. Okay, if you think being born of a bloodline makes you bad, then you're a bigot. That's no different than saying because of someone's race, they're inherently bad. It's what you do with yourself. It's your choice. It's your free will. And so I am definitely a descendant of Victoria, but I am not the same as her. Now, what's interesting is they believe the name Boudicca is actually the name Victoria. And that maybe this is where Victoria proclaimed herself to be Queen Victoria. Maybe Victoria herself was trying to harness the power of Boudicca, the real Victoria. And this is when Thomas Thornycroft, the sculptor for Victoria, started to create the famous sculpture of Boudicca that still stands today. Now, I, I don't know if you guys noticed, but Thomas Thornycroft in the picture is showing you that he is a Freemason. And I don't have all the answers. Again, this is why it's a deep dive. This is why we're discussing it. But I do believe that Boudicca was one of us. I do believe that she was a high priestess for the Celtic and Druid culture. And that she, her lineage, came through Kiev, through the planet Kinteka. I believe her people were magical, just as we all are. And they knew they were magical. And I believe that the effort to wipe them out was coming from the controllers, and the controllers are the Roman Empire of today. I just don't know whether that happened again at the fall of Atlantis or the fall of Tartaria. And I do believe that there is a connection between Boudicca and Magdalene. I don't know what that connection is though. Is it that they are just both two Celtic high priestesses? Or is it that not only are they Celtic high priestesses, but their story has been mutilated because of their the power and the strength of their divine femininity? Or is it possible that they're the same person? I don't know. But all I know is my relationship with Magdalene. And I know that Magdalene just kept telling me, Boudicca. Boudicca. I know that Boudicca was a high priestess and a warrior, and I have called on her many times in the past couple of weeks since I realized that she wasn't just a historical figure. And I have felt her energy around me. So whether her and Magdalene are the same, whether they're different, whether they were maybe sisters, I don't know. But there's a connection there, an important connection. And I personally believe that Boudicca is an ascended master, just like Magdalene, just like Quan Yin, just like Isis, just like Hathor. And I believe that her energy is still with us on the other side of the veil, supporting us, helping us, going to war with us. And so I do this deep dive not only to celebrate her and to honor her, but to also let you guys know if I'm right, there's a whole other being that's here to support you. And she's a badass.